Hi everyone, it's Phil Frost from Main Street ROI, and I want to welcome you to today's presentation, The Five Steps to Get Your Business Ranking on the First Page of Google. And I want to thank MailGen for organizing this. And I have some housekeeping we will get started with here. First, I want to make sure everyone knows that you can post questions. I'm actually going to get that box over on my other screen. In case anyone has questions, you can just type those right into the questions box and I will uh, see those pop up and answer those as they come in. And I always recommend everyone turns off distractions. Uh, it's best if you're not also trying to check email and scroll through your Facebook feed. And finally, I want to see who's on today. I have a couple polls. So the first poll here is just to see who is on. And the question is, <clears throat> are you currently working with an SEO agency or a consultant? Yes or no? And then the third answer there is we are an agency or, a, or I am a consultant. Whenever we host these trainings, we always find uh, agencies and, and uh, consultants join as well. Uh, in this case, looks like none are on. Uh, almost everyone has voted and has said no. Actually, 100% said no. So let me close that out. And the next question here is, what is your current or anticipated monthly SEO budget? Just to get a sense for the size of your SEO campaigns. <clears throat> and uh, right now it's 100% less than 500. And a few here now, 15%, 15 to 1,000. And it looks like most people have voted. So let me close that out. So everyone's under $1,000 a month. And the last question, then we will get moving here. This is just to see what are some of the other digital marketing channels that you're currently using? Are you using Google AdWords advertising and or Bing advertising? Facebook advertising, email marketing, social media marketing, or other. If you choose other, just please type in what it is you're doing into that questions box. All right, getting a lot of answers here. <clears throat> Almost half of the people have voted, just over half now, up to 64%. All right, looks like it's settling out here. I'll actually uh, share these with y'all. We've got 80% uh, have voted. So let me close it. 79% have voted. So let me uh, share that. And Leva, hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly, said she's blogging and using inbound marketing. Uh, you should be able to see those results there. 36% are advertising, 50% using Facebook ads. I'm uh, pleasantly surprised, 64% using email marketing, which is great to see. That's one of the best channels you should be using. 45% social media, and then 9% uh, said other. So let's get back to the schedule here. Thank you for answering those polls. Here's what we're gonna cover today. I'm gonna walk through some important up Google updates that you need to understand. If you want to be successful with SEO, you definitely need to have a quick history lesson with Google, and I'm going to walk through that, uh, give you, get you up to speed on uh, where Google has been and also where it's headed. And based on those Google updates, <clears throat> there are three old school uh, tactics you want to avoid. They'll, uh, these are tactics that used to work, but they'll actually get you into trouble now. I'll also walk through two tactics you can use to get very quick rankings, actually in less than 30 days. And I'll walk through the five steps, the five rules you now need to follow with SEO. And I do have a special offer for all the attendees to help you get started today. Now, if this is your first training from uh, Main Street ROI, you're probably wondering, who am I? Why should you listen to me? Well, again, my name is Phil Frost. I'm the founder of Main Street ROI, and our business provides digital marketing services like SEO, online advertising, email marketing, and social media. And we also pr provide training. We provide a lot of free training like this 
presentation today, as well as uh, the, the blog articles that we post on our site, and then we send those via our email newsletter. And then we have some more in-depth training. If you go to MainStreetROI.com forward slash training, you can see all of our training courses that go into uh, more depth on each, uh, each topic. To date, we've helped over 2,000 businesses with their digital marketing, and my thought leadership in this space has been featured in Forbes, Inc., Amex, as well as Mashable. And this is my favorite slide. I'm also the proud father of these cute kids here. We've got Violet on the left. She's four and a half years old. She's at her, uh, her summer camp today, hopefully at the pool. And that's uh, my chubby son, Emmett, on the right. He's uh, just over two years old. And my beautiful wife, Erin, in the middle. And this picture was taken uh, right around April 2nd. That's my son's birthday, his uh, two-year-old birthday party. You can see all the kids in the background in the mirror. And that's on the uh, upper west side of Manhattan. All right, I mentioned I want to give a, a brief history of Google. And this is going to kind of set the stage for how Google works and how to be successful with SEO. All right, so way back in the day, some of the older folks on the line will remember a search engine called Alta Vista. And this was one of the first search engines. <clears throat> and uh, back then, SEO was pretty easy. All you had to do was put the, the keyword that you wanted to rank for on your web page, and you had to put it on your page more than anyone else had that keyword on their page, and you were likely to be ranked number one. That's basically how the, the search engine worked. If, uh, if you did a search in Alta Vista, that search engine's just looking for the page that mentions that word more often than, than other pages. So it's very easy. But on the flip side, the, the search results were also full of spam. And if you remember doing searches back then, I actually do remember this, uh, you could be doing a, a search and just get completely irrelevant search results. And it wasn't very useful. And even one of the big problems back then was you would see porn sites ranking when you're doing a, a completely uh, normal search for you know trying to do research for a, a homework project and you'd see uh, irrelevant and even porn sites on the first page. So SEO is super easy, but unfortunately the search results were full of spam. So that was the big problem that Google solved back in uh, around 1998. They came in with a, a change to how the search engines worked, and their algorithm didn't just look at the words on your page, they also took into account how many other websites were linking to your website. And if you think about it, uh, anytime a website links to another website, that's basically like a vote in their favor. It's basically saying, hey, uh, I think this other website has good information. You should go check them out. And that's why I'm going to link to them. And Google used that in their algorithm. And that's really the, the, the core of their algorithm is based on how many other websites are linking to your website. And that cleaned up a lot of the spam. Uh, it wasn't uh, um, uh, as easy anymore to get ranked high because uh, you had to get all these links from other websites. So that, that wiped out a lot of the spam. And that made the search results much more useful. And Google just became the number one search engine. And uh, they've been number one ever since. And here's a really important takeaway. Uh, I want you to definitely remember this, that Google, uh, actually, the, the vast majority of their revenue comes from people clicking on their search ads. So if you do a, a search in Google, you'll see the first results are labeled ad. They have a little uh, icon that says ad. And there's typically one to four results at the top that are advertisers. Those are uh, people advertising in Google AdWords, and they are paying to be on the first page. People click on those links, and then those businesses have to pay Google. And the big chunk of Google's revenue comes from that search ad revenue. So Google, their whole business depends on the, the search ads. And with that in mind, 
they uh, the, the reason their users are using Google is because uh, Google has good results. And if people uh, go to Google, do a search, and see poor results, they're going to stop using Google and go to another search engine, and Google will lose a big chunk of their revenue. So if you think about it, Google's business depends on showing the absolute best search results. So that's really the big takeaway that I want everyone to remember. And that's why Google hires some of the smartest people uh, in the world to come work for Google and, uh, and fight spam, to, to really improve their algorithm so that they're, they're constantly showing the best search results for their users. That's why th their, their whole business is about showing the absolute best search results and giving a really good user experience so that people co keep coming back to Google and click on those ads to, uh, to grow their revenue. So with that in mind, you've probably heard of some Google updates over the years. And all of these Google updates <clears throat> were, were to, to weed out spam in the search results. So the first one here is the Panda update. This was a, an infamous update that uh, hit a lot of websites and, uh, and, and cleaned up a lot of the spam in the search results. And this update was targeting websites that gave a bad user experience. And as I mentioned before, that's really a threat to Google's business model. It makes sense why they went after those sites. And uh, it's basically sites that have poor quality content. So if, if it's not uh, a well-written web page, then that would uh, Google does not want to show that high in the search results. Or maybe a, it's a site that has uh, poor navigation. So if you get on the site and it's just not clear how to navigate and use the site, so it has poor usability, that would again be a website that Google does not want to rank high in the search results. And that's what they were targeting with the Panda update. The next update was the Penguin update. And this is related to the core of their algorithm, which is how they look at how many links are, are you have going to your website. Uh, so once you understand that Google's algorithm is based on other websites linking to you, uh, a lot of businesses figured that out and they took it to the extreme. And what they did was they actually built up other websites. Um, they would basically buy domains and build blogs for the sole purpose of then linking to their main website. And they, a lot of businesses took this to the, to the extreme again and, and built a big network of hundreds, even thousands of blogs on the internet that would then link back to their own websites. And as you can imagine, Google did not like that. Uh, that was a form of manipulation and uh, those were not real links. Those were not really other websites voting for their website. They were just cr basically creating those links. So the Penguin update was really targeting the websites that were getting links that were not natural or that were the, this concept of over-optimized. So they really did not deserve to be ranked high because they weren't getting natural links. Those the links that they had were, uh, were basically bogus. <clears throat> Third update here is Google Plus. And uh, you probably heard... Uh, Google Plus was launched. It was kind of Google's answer to Facebook, which is the the giant in the social media space. But Google Plus did not take off. It was basically a big failure. And uh, so Google kind of uh, swept that under the rug for several years. Uh, but But more recently, I think it was in the past six months, they actually started to invest more into the Google Plus platform. So I really want to highlight that today and, and just let you know that I believe social signals will become more important in Google's algorithm. That's definitely debatable. Uh, and there are no facts out there that say Google's using social media signals. However, I do believe that's the direction they're moving in just based on where they're investing and they are investing in Google+. And the last one here I want everyone to know about is the Hummingbird update, which is fairly recent. Uh, and this is due to the rise in, uh, in mobile 
and how more and more people are actually searching Google using their voice. They'll actually talk into their mobile phone and let's say they, they talk into it and they say, uh, Google, I want to know the uh, the best restaurants nearby. And to you and I, that's a very simple question. Or sorry, the uh, best places to eat nearby. To you and I, that, that's a very simple question. Best places to eat. Uh, we can translate that translate that to to mean you want to know what are the best restaurants near your phys physical location. But to a uh, algorithm, to a computer program. That's actually pretty complicated, and it took a while for Google to figure out how to understand context and synonyms, but eventually their engineers did figure that out, and they actually had to uh, completely overhaul their algorithm, and that was the, the release of the Hummingbird update. So they have a, a, a basically a brand new uh, algorithm that now is capable of understanding context, it understands if you're um, uh, uh, searching uh, on your mobile phone and uh, you type in nearby, you're, you're looking for a company or a business nearby. It also understands synonyms. So if you're looking for best places to eat, Google can basically translate that into uh, you're actually looking for restaurants near your location. Now, uh, Ian just said, hello, question mark. Hopefully everyone can hear me. Uh, that's the first time I've heard someone uh, mention that they might not be able to hear me. So I think the audio is okay. If anyone else is having trouble, uh, looks like I dropped out for a bit. So hopefully it's okay now. All right, so with the with the Google history out of the way, I did promise that would be quick. And now you understand the uh, the, the, the updates the important updates, I want to walk through some old school SEO tactics that you want to avoid. And uh, these, again, these are tactics that used to work, but because of those important updates, they'll, they'll actually get you into trouble. And the first one here is over-optimized web pages. So I hear a lot of questions, I'll probably get the question here today, today is, you know, what's the appropriate keyword density for a page? And I actually, I, I hate that question for many reasons, but the I, I basically, the way to answer that is that you should not even be thinking about keyword density. You want to instead be writing naturally and be writing with your prospective customer in mind rather than uh, Google. So you don't want to, when you start getting into keyword density, that's kind of going down the path of over-optimizing your web pages and you can start getting into trouble because of that Panda update that I mentioned earlier. So you don't want to uh, keyword stuff. What I mean by keyword stuff, that means putting the keyword unnaturally onto your pages. I'm going to talk later about you know, some of the important elements that you, where you do want to put your keyword, but just, uh, just remember when you're actually writing the, the, the main copy on your page, you don't, when you do this all correctly, you don't want to be worrying about uh, stuffing your keywords into the copy. You just want to write naturally. And what this comes down to and what Google wants is that you're providing valuable information on your pages. So that's, a, that's another big takeaway. Don't worry about Google when you're writing the copy. Worry about your prospective customers and write it in a way that it is using sales copy best practices rather than SEO best practices. And again, we'll, we'll talk more later about where, it, where it's important to put your keywords, but right now I'm just focusing about on the uh, body copy. The other old school tactic you wanna avoid is self-created links. And this is related to the Penguin update. I talked about this earlier, <clears throat> but uh, you don't, first, you don't wanna be buying links. Uh, Google, if Google sees that you purchased a link from another business, then uh, Google just won't count that link. So it's basically a waste of money from an SEO perspective. They see that as, as advertising, which, um, which is okay. I'm not saying you should not advertise, 
but don't do that for the purposes of SEO. So those those links will ultimately not count towards your SEO if you're uh, paying for them. You also don't want to get links from irrelevant websites. That should be fairly obvious. Uh, but let's say you have a website that uh, where, where it's an e-commerce site that sells jewelry, and you have a friend that has a car dealership website. Really doesn't make sense for that friend to add a link to your jewelry website from a car dealership website. That would be a, an irrelevant link, and it's basically a red flag to Google that you probably did not get that link naturally. Now, the, the next bullet point here is related to anchor text. And uh, you can see the example there. It says day spots and blue font. It's underlined. Uh, that is, should be a signal that it's a, it's a link. In that phrase, day spot, is what's called anchor text for that link. And Google looks at the anchor text, and if that link was going to, let's say, your website, then uh, Google's going to say, okay, well, the anchor text says day spa. Your website is probably relevant to the keyword day spa. And now that you know that, uh, and that, that would help you rank higher for the keyword day spa, you might take that to the extreme and go out and try to get a uh, dozen or hundreds or even thousands of links that say day spa if you wanted to try to rank high for that keyword. And that's what businesses did. And they, uh, they again, they took it to the extreme. And Google, when, when uh, Google can see that all of your links or the majority of your links have the same exact anchor text, that is a, a big red flag for Google that you're probably doing something that's unnatural in those links. Uh, the, the, the websites that are linking to you probably didn't all uh, just you know, use the same exact text naturally. They, you, you probably were creating those yourself. Uh, and then again, Google's not going to count those when they're not naturally occurring links. And then finally, when it comes to getting links, you want to focus on sharing content. You don't want to think about getting links as building them or creating them yourself. Okay, the third and final old school tactic you want to avoid is unnecessary SEO pages. This was a another tactic that, that would work well um, not too long ago but now it will definitely get you into trouble. Uh, what you wanna do, so the example here I'm showing is, is another day spa example where there's two different keywords, day spa in NYC versus NYC day spa. Those are two different variations of, uh, of a keyword that is relevant for a day spa. And Google knows now that they understand Context and synonyms. Google knows that someone searching day spa in NYC is basically looking for the same thing as another person that's searching NYC day spa. So you really only need one page to target both of those different variations. Now, not too long ago, uh, Google was not that smart, or Google's algorithm was not that smart. So you would it would actually be beneficial to create separate pages. And that's what a lot of people did, and that's what a lot of uh, SEO consultants recommended. So that did work well, but now you don't want to do that. Uh, Google understands that those are basically the same keywords. So you want to, what you want to do is when we, we'll talk about this later, we'll talk about keyword research. And when you do your keyword research, you want to group similar keywords together. And then uh, you just want to have one page that you're trying to rank for very similar keywords. And I wanna show you what will happen if you don't follow those instructions. This was, uh, this was a message that was sent to one of our clients right when we started working with them because before we started working with them, they went out and created different pages on their site trying to target very similar keyword phrases and what they did was they, what ends up happening is the 
those pages are very similar. So obviously, if I go back here, <clears throat> if you tried to create separate pages for Day Spa and NYC and NYC Day Spa, ultimately the copy on those pages is going to be very similar or nearly identical. And what happens in that case, if Google sees that a lot of your content is very similar or uh, duplicated, you will get a message like this. And it says, Google has detected thin content on your site that provides little or no value, no added value. Uh, this critical issue results in irrelevant or low value search results for Google search users and can negatively impact your site's rankings. So the, Google actually applied a manual spam action and uh, what, what happens then is you have to uh, obviously fix that problem, let Google know that you did fix that problem, and uh, that takes time. And then that uh, uh, you, you basically have to clean that all up before Google will uh, let you rank high again in the search results. So if you try to take shortcuts um, and, uh, and, and try to target a lot of different similar keywords with duplicate content, what will ultimately happen is uh, it will backfire and uh, Google will give you a manual spam action. All right, before we get to the five steps, I wanna give you a couple predictions about where I see SEO going. This first one is a extremely safe prediction. I can uh, guarantee that Google will continue to fight SEO spam because again, any spam on the first page of Google is a threat to Google's business model. Uh, it basically means that they could lose revenue. So they are going to continue to fight keyword stuffing. Uh, they'll fight unnatural inbound links. If you're trying to do anything uh, sketchy and get uh, links unnaturally. And they will continue to fight unnecessary SEO pages trying to target similar keywords. Hopefully everyone's aware of the rise of mobile, <clears throat> but if you're not, I wanna highlight that. Mobile and local signals are rising in importance. More and more people are using mobile to, uh, to search, and actually <clears throat> more people are using Google on their mobile devices than they are on desktop computers. And because of that, you may have heard this in the news, Google is actually moving to a mobile-first index. And what that means is that rather than looking at your desktop computer, which is what Google does now, and what they, they've always done that, they, they would go to your desktop, your desktop uh, version of your website, <clears throat> they would do that as the default and make their uh, analysis about whether or not you should rank high. Well, they're going to now, once this rolls out, they'll start looking at the mobile version of your website as the default version and make decisions about whether or not you should rank using the mobile version of your site. So it's a, a, a big shift, and that is uh, it's coming in the next year or so. It's uh, undetermined. Google had said it was going to happen early 2017. That did not happen, and now I believe they're saying it might not happen until two, uh, 2018. But if, you, if you haven't already worked on your mobile, the mobile version of your website, then uh, now is definitely the time to to invest in that. And then uh, I mentioned this earlier, I do believe social media signals will become more important in the future. I, I do believe that's why Google's investing in Google Plus, and it, it's just a natural progression of their algorithm to incorporate some of the social signals, because not only are links important, and those are votes in uh, in a business's favor, but uh, social media shares, likes, and uh, uh, activity online, uh, I, I believe will also be a factor in their algorithm in the future. This is just a, a key takeaway. Hopefully you've gotten this point across at this point. That SEO is not about tricking Google, it's about partnering with Google to help their users. And that's, uh, it's really a negative mindset that I hear a lot that uh, businesses believe SEO is about tricking Google uh, to get their their website to rank high. But I, I urge you to, to switch that mindset and really think about uh, partnering with Google and thinking from their perspective and uh, 
uh, what that would mean is you know just making sure that you're setting your website up in a way that helps Google's users find what they need and what they want because that's ultimately what Google's trying to do. All right, let's dive into the five steps. <clears throat> I call these the five R's. And the first R <clears throat> is uh, research. <clears throat> More specifically, we're talking about keyword research. <clears throat> so we want to find all of the keywords that your prospective customers are searching to find your products or services. And the keyword I recommend, or sorry, the tool I recommend is Google's Keyword Planner tool. And if you just go to google.com and search uh, Keyword Planner tool, it should be the first result. You'll want to click on that. And then uh, you do have, you're going to have to jump through a couple hoops to use the tool. They, uh, they switched this on us pretty recently. You have to have a Google AdWords account to use the Keyword Planner tool. And I know that's annoying if you're not already using Google AdWords. Uh, it can be a little confusing. But uh, I promise all you have to do is jump through that hoop and then you can use it. You don't actually have to advertise. You don't have to spend any money. So you just go uh, to uh, go to that link, set up your uh, AdWords account, um, just don't turn on any ads, and then you can go use the Keyword Planner tool. Now the other little hiccup here is that, uh, again, fairly recently, Google decided if you're not advertising, then they are not going to show you um, the, the search volume numbers. <clears throat> They're going to show you ranges. So rather than saying a certain keyword is searched 200 times a month, they might say it's searched between 100 and 500 times a month. So that's pretty annoying. <clears throat> Not really sure why they did that. Uh, but regardless, that is how it works. And uh, if you're not advertising, you will see ranges. But uh, I would certainly argue that the tool still works and still provides value because you have those ranges. And the reality is the numbers that they're showing for the people who are advertising, those aren't exact numbers either. Those are just, um, uh, th th all those numbers are rounded to the nearest uh, tenth or a hundredth. So don't get too caught up in the exact numbers and don't worry that uh, if you're not advertising you have to use the ranges. What's even more important is this concept of buying intent. So when you use the keyword planner tool you're going to search for some of the keywords you think people are typing into Google to find your products or services and then the, the tool will show you how many times that those keywords are searched each month, that's search volume. And they'll also show you below, if you keep scrolling down, they'll, they'll show you additional related keywords. So it's kind of like a thesaurus. And when you start scrolling through those additional keywords, what you wanna do is ask yourself, is the person searching that keyword doing research? Or are they more likely looking to make a purchase. And this is it's basically a spectrum. <clears throat> Let's say on the left hand side is research and on the right hand side is uh, they're definitely going to buy. You want to make sure that the the keyword when when you ask that question, it's more likely that uh, they're going to fall on the right side of that spectrum and they're more likely to be searching in order to make a purchase. And that's called buying intent versus research intent. And if the keyword has more buying intent, it's going to lead to more sales. Because at the end of the day, when you're trying to rank high in Google, you're not just trying to be number one in Google, you're trying to drive leads and sales for your business. And if you're ranking for a research intent keyword, that will lead to less people uh, wanting to actually make a purchase versus ranking high for a buying intent keyword that will uh, lead to more of those folks actually wanting to make a purchase. 
And the final question you want to ask is, do you deserve to be number one? Uh, do you actually offer the product, the information, or the service that the person is searching for? Because if you don't, then you uh, you either have to create a new page on your site, or uh, you're just going to be in an uphill battle. And uh, that that can be um, uh, something that businesses think they want to attempt. For example, you might find that a particular keyword is searched uh, tens of thousands of times a month, and uh, you, you think that it would be great to rank high for that. But if you don't actually offer that information, that product or service, you're probably not going to rank high. Or actually, I could guarantee you're not going to rank high. Okay, step two, once you've found the relevant keywords that have buying intent and also have search volume, we need to move on to relevance. And specifically, we're talking about website relevance. This is really marketing 101. You want to match the message on your site to what the market is searching. And I mentioned this earlier, how when you do your keyword research, you're going to find uh, a lot of similar keywords, and you'll want to group those similar keywords together. And then you want to pick one page on your site that you will optimize for those that group of similar keywords. And then uh, you're probably asking, what does it mean to optimize? And I promised I would tell you those those key elements that you need to put your keyword. And these are those key elements. The first one here is the title of your page. And I put the HTML in there in case you're familiar. Uh, the title of the page or the title tag in HTML is that less than sign and it says title greater than sign. Everything after that and before the closing title tag. That's uh, one of the most important elements of a page for SEO purposes. The, the analogy I like to use is uh, chapters in a textbook. And if you uh, open up a textbook and you want to find, let's say you have a question and you want to find that answer, what you'll likely do is scroll through the table of contents. And uh, if the table of contents is, is nicely laid out, you'll be able to fairly quickly find the section of that book that most likely has the answer to your question. That's because the table of contents has uh, unique, each uh, chapter has a unique name uh, or title, and uh, it, it has a descriptive name. And that's also very important when it comes to uh, creating the title tags for the pages of your site. You want to think about them as if they were chapters in a book. And that's kind of how Google is going to use them. They can uh, kind of use that as a shortcut. They can look at the title of your page to figure out, does your page likely have the answer or have the information that that searcher is looking for when they type the keyword into Google? So with that in mind, you want to make sure all of your titles are unique. It would be pretty confusing if you opened up a textbook and all the, the chapter names were exactly the same you wouldn't know which chapter to go to. So that uh, is also confusing for Google. You don't want to have duplicate titles. You want them all to be unique. And then you want them to be uh, descriptive. And you want them to be, uh, you want the keyword that you're trying to rank for in the title of your page. Because uh, if someone is searching for that keyword and that keyword is in the title of your page, then right away, Google is going to look at that page and say, okay, this page is relevant for what this person is searching for. So again, the title is uh, one of the most important elements. You want to make sure the keyword that you're trying to target is in the title of your page. And then you want to uh, take some of the variations of those keyword phrases and put them in the headers of your page. And if you remember writing papers in school, uh, what you would likely do is uh, break your your uh, paper up into sections, and you might have headers that, um, that would uh, name each of those sections. 
and th those would be descriptive headers that kind of uh, if you were all, if all you did was skim through the paper and read the headers, you'd get a pretty good idea about what that uh, paper was about. <laughs> Again, Google can do that. It's kind of a shortcut if they look at the headers and see the uh, the keyword or variations of the keyword in the headers. Again, that's a, a strong signal for Google that your page is highly relevant and it's likely that the searcher will find what they're looking for um, if your page was to rank high in Google. <clears throat> so the, those are the, really the two most important pages uh, elements. And then the third element here is the body copy. I mentioned uh, very early on how I don't even recommend you think about Google when you're writing the body copy. You should really think about the, the prospective customer, and that is uh, that's definitely true. If you're if you're doing this correctly and you have one page on your site that's targeting a uh, group of similar keywords, then again you want to put the the keyword in the title. You want to put some variations of that keyword in the headers, and then when you write the copy, and even if you're writing it with sales copy in mind. You're just going to naturally, it would, it would be almost impossible to not mention that keyword when you're writing. Because again, that's the one page on your site that is about that particular topic or those uh, those similar keywords. You're just going to naturally incorporate those. And it's much better to do that without even thinking about it than to try to uh, unnaturally stuff the keywords into the body copy. That's not going to help you. I did see a question, sorry for the long pause there. I was reading uh, Hans's question. He said, I use a lot of ordered lists and unordered lists. Are they good for SEO? Um, so it's not really, are they good for SEO? Um, but I guess I could uh, interpret that question, you know, is that an important element? Basically that's getting rolled into the body copy of the of the page. Um, it's not something that has more weight than anything else. Uh, but if you're doing lists, that is great for uh, usability and readability. Uh, to have bullet point lists, it's just easier for people to scan. So what can happen then uh, from an SEO perspective, if it improves readability and usability, um, that's going to indirectly help you from an SEO perspective because if somebody does search, find your page, and get there, they're going to more likely stay on your page and be able to read it um, and then possibly even click around and stay on your page, and those are going to be positive signals to uh, help you with SEO. <clears throat> David asked how important are H1 compared with H2. So basically, uh, I listed out H1, H2, H3. H1 is the main header, and I'd recommend you have one H1 on your page, and that would be the uh, the most important header. And then it's kind of like, um, if you think about bullet points, and uh, you keep indenting the bullet point, uh, H2 is kind of that next level indented, H3 is the next level. Um, those are uh, basically subheaders, I guess is the way to to explain them. And uh, uh, H1 would be the most important one, and then uh, H2, H2 and H3 they they uh, would go down uh, in importance as you keep, increase the number after the H. Um, I see a lot of questions coming in here. I might have to take them at the end. So if I don't answer your question now, we are going to have a live Q&A, so don't worry, I'll, I'll get to that. But I do want to get through everything first. Uh, golden rule of relevance, uh, basically just putting yourself in the prospect's shoes. Uh, you want to create the web page that you yourself would actually want to find if you were the one searching for that particular keyword. I think that's a great exercise. Just make sure you're creating a, a really good page that deserves to rank high. 
All right, the third R here is reputation. And we're talking about website reputation. And that is uh, basically what's called your domain authority. And the number one factor in your domain authority or your online reputation is the quantity and quality of links from other websites. This is basically reputation by association. So lots of other legitimate websites are linking to your website. Google is going to think that you are also a legitimate and authoritative website. It's similar to the real world. If you're hanging out with well-respected people, uh, other people will think you're well-respected. And if you're hanging out with some sketchy people, other people will then think that you are probably sketchy as well. And again, can't emphasize this enough, you wanna focus on attracting links with really good uh, content on your own site versus buying or just trying to go out and create links yourself. <clears throat> All right, so uh, with those three steps, you should now understand uh, the two tactics you can use to get ranked in 30 days or less. And the first tactic here, and then we'll get back to the, uh, the fourth and fifth step. First tactic is, is piggyback SEO. And what you're going to do is piggyback on another website's uh, high authority or strong domain authority. And you can do that by publishing content on another website and you put the keyword that you wanna rank for in the title of that uh, content. So if it's an article, the title of the article uh, will have your target keyword in the title. And here's an example. So you can see this in action. The keyword here that's being searched, you can see at the top is how to create a Google AdWords campaign. And then uh, the arrow is pointing to an article on kissmetrics.com. That's an article that I wrote and then published on kissmetrics.com with the title, How to Create a Profitable Google AdWords Campaign from Scratch. And because that keyword is in the title, and because kissmetrics.com has a strong domain authority, that's why that ranks high in Google. You can actually see it's ranking number three at the time that I took the screenshot. And uh, again, that is a good illustration of the first three steps. Uh, keyword research, so again, just that would be finding that keyword and then uh, making the page relevant, uh, putting the keyword in the title, and then obviously the article is about that particular topic. And then uh, the third R there of re reputation, we're piggybacking here on the reputation of another domain, kissmetrics.com. And just so you see that it works for other keywords, this keyword here is just typing in uh, Google AdWords campaign. Again, ranking number three, just under Google's own websites. And that's because that keyword is in the title. It's also uh, mentioned in the article. Um, but it, no, that wasn't something I forced. I just wrote the article about about that particular topic. And then obviously, when I write about that topic, I would naturally just mention Google AdWords campaign in the article. Okay, so that's tactic number one. That was piggyback SEO. And you can get a web page to rank very quickly if you publish an article on another website that has a strong domain authority. And the, the reason you would want to do that is especially if you have a new website. Every new website starts with a a domain authority of zero, so you basically have zero reputation, and it does take some time to earn the trust of Google. So while you're earning that trust, uh, it can make sense to then uh, publish content on other people's websites to try to get uh, try to get ranked high, and then in that article you would then want to link to your website, and that's how you send them over ultimately to your website. So the second tactic here is local SEO. Uh, and that's because local SEO is booming. 30% of mobile searches are local. 76% of mobile nearby searches visit a store. So people searching, let's say, a hardware store nearby, 76% of those will actually visit a store. And then 28% of those people who are searching for a hardware store nearby will actually make a purchase. 
So it does drive sales. And that's basically the same three steps here. You want to use Google's keyword tool to do your research. You want to make your Google My Business page relevant because with local SEO, you're, you're not exactly ranking your website. You're ranking your Google My Business page. Um, so if you do a search, let's say again, hardware store nearby, on the first page of Google, you'll see a map. And then underneath that map, you'll see uh, the list of businesses that are nearby, and then in the map, you'll have little uh, location icons to show you where those businesses are. So we're talking about getting ranked there in the, the map results. And when it comes to making your Google My Business relevant, you wanna make sure you're choosing the right categories. And then building up your reputation comes down to what are called citations and online reviews. Everyone knows online reviews, you wanna get your customers to review you on your Google My Business page. And then citations are mentions of your business name, address, and phone number on other websites, like other business directories. So you might be listed in, let's say, Yelp. Um, Best of the Web is another directory. Uh, there's just thousands of uh, business directories out there. And as long as it shows your name, address, and phone number, that counts as a citation and the more citations you have, that builds up your Google My Business reputation. And I won't read this, but this is a, an example of a local SEO success story from Barney. And uh, that's just to show you some proof that it can be very quick. Uh, he said about a month ago, he started to go through those steps and he got ranked and actually started working on a project uh, that came in directly from Google Plus Local which is now called Google My Business. All right, so at this point, we've gone through the three R's. I went through the two tactics. And the next R is my favorite. This is revenue. So step four here is because the goal is not to just get ranked in Google. The goal is to actually drive revenue. There's really three factors. You want to have compelling website copy. That's related to the fact that you should write the copy with sales copy in mind, not for Google. You want to make sure you have social proof on your site. That's because most people are skeptical. They want to see some reviews on your site. And then you want to have a CTA or a call to action. And that's just, you know, whatever the next step is that you want prospective customers to take, you want to make sure that's front and center. The second item here is a lead magnet. And that's typically a free report, or if you have an e-commerce site, it could just be a coupon. And you're going to offer that in exchange for an email address to generate leads that then you can follow up with via email marketing. You might be wondering, why do I need that? And that's because the reality of uh, online marketing is that the, the vast majority of website visitors to your site are not going to be ready to make a purchase. That's just the, the harsh reality. And uh, typical conversion rates on a site can be in the neighborhood of 2%. And if 2% of people are buying, that means 98% of your traffic is coming to your site and then just leaving. And if they come to your site and leave, you likely are never going to see them again because they're not going to remember your uh, website or your business. So you need a lead magnet to capture their information and then you can follow up via email marketing to bring them back to your site and actually make a purchase. And the third factor is related to step one, which is keyword research. And you want to focus on those buying intent keywords so that uh, when you are ranking high, you're ranking for keywords that are actually going to lead to sales because those are uh, the people searching that are your prospective customers. And I also recommend you have some tracking in place so that you can track your SEO return on investment. And the tool I recommend is totally free. It's Google Analytics. You just go to analytics.google.com and uh, create your free account. And then you put the code on your site. And then Google will automatically start tracking the traffic from SEO. And if you set up your conversions correctly, then uh, you can start seeing uh, all of your traffic from SEO 
and also how many leads and sales you're generating. All right, the fifth step here is responsibility, and it really comes down to answering this question. Who is responsible for your SEO? Is it uh, you, is it someone else on your team, or is it a consultant or an agency? Uh, SEO is not a set it and forget it strategy. That's uh, another misconception out there that you just need to do this one time. Uh, the reality is there is a one time, what I call a tune-up, and that's to get your website relevant for your target keywords. But then there's ongoing work to build up your reputation, which is what will really boost you up higher in the search results. And finally, I, I recommend to all businesses that they only delegate after they understand the basics of SEO. And that was really the goal of this presentation to today. I wanted to give you uh, a really good a good foundation as far as how the search engine works, where it's been, some of the important updates, uh, some of the big mistakes to avoid. And that way, if you do decide to delegate, whether that's hiring someone in-house or hiring a consultant or an agency, you'll uh, you'll be better uh, armed to vet that uh, that person or that company and make sure you're making a, a good decision. And this slide here is to highlight another misconception that Google updates are bad. There's a lot of fear in the industry around Google updates and how uh, you could quickly lose your rankings when Google makes a shift. But the reality is, again, Google's trying to get rid of the sites that don't belong. So if you're following best practices and you're doing all the right things, then what should happen with a Google update is uh, your competitors who are not doing best practices or maybe doing something a little shady, they should lose rankings, which would open up a spot for you to move up uh, to, to a higher position in Google. All right, before we get to q and I have a, a special offer for all the attendees, and that is a bundle of three step-by-step 90-minute -step video training courses. So this includes the complete SEO tune-up. And again, you can go to MainStreetROI.com forward slash training, and you can see these are sold for $97. The local SEO formula that walks through everything you need to do to get ranked high in those local map results. <clears throat> and then the third course is the introduction to SEO analytics. And that walks through how to set up Google Analytics properly, uh, to track all of your marketing, and then uh, also all of the important uh, metrics and reports you need to run to track your SEO. Total value there, so three courses at $97 each is $291. But you get, get everything today for just $97 when you go to MainStreetROI.com forward slash SEO bundle. If you're not interested in training, I know that uh, is true for a lot of folks on the line. I do want to offer you a, a free SEO assessment. If you're not looking to do this yourself, uh, it might make more sense to have someone do it for you. And uh, what I can offer you then is a, a, free, assess a free SEO assessment, in which case we'll uh, review your website and uh, find opportunities to improve your SEO. And that would include a call with one of our marketing advisors. There's obviously no uh, obligation to use us for SEO services, uh, but we would uh, show you where the areas are to improve. All right, looks like most people have voted. And then we'll get to q and I'm going to close that out. All right, so we've got live Q&A here. Uh, in case you wanted that URL, it's in the upper left-hand corner, MainStreetROI.com forward slash SEO bundle. Uh, let's see, I missed a couple questions here. Uh, so David said, do you need to show H1, H2, H3 tags as distinct subheadings, or can you include them within copy text? So generally, 
headers are going to look like uh, actual headers. Um, you can format them however you want. That doesn't really matter. So if you didn't want them to be big, they're typically bigger and, and bolder font than the rest of the, the copy on the page. If you didn't want that for design reasons, um, you can always edit that and that does not impact SEO. But uh, <clears throat> you, you, to answer that question, you generally will have <clears throat> your headers on separate lines. Um, similar to writing a paper, it's on a separate line and then below that header is the copy related to that header. Uh, Mark said I'm in the UK. Uh, so for the, the keyword research tool, uh, the keyword planner tool, you can select the country and uh, you definitely want to do that if you are in another location, another country. Um, and if you just wanted data for, let's say, um, uh, you're in the UK, so maybe you just wanted data for London, maybe you're just locally focused, you should be able to select that as well. You can select country, you can select the city, and then get data specific to that location. Uh, Ian said, how many, are, how many headers does Google use? Um, I'm going to translate that. I think you're asking how many, or, or how many headers does Google look at? You clarified, and you said, you said I have six. I believe you're, you mean uh, you have H1, H2, H3, H4, H5, H6, so all the way to six. Google's going to read all of those, um, with the most important one being your H1. Um, so I would definitely prioritize getting the keyword that you want to target in the title of your page. And then uh, I always recommend a variation of that keyword in the H1. And then uh, from there, it, it's really less important. You're, you're not going to need to be putting the keyword in, let's say, the H6. But you certainly could. If it makes sense, um, do it. But I, don't, I definitely don't want to be recommending that you're unnaturally trying to squeeze the keyword into your, your H6 when it doesn't really make sense. So it, it, it should make sense to put in, it in your title and your H1. And then from there, it's basically a judgment call. You know, if it makes sense, by all means, you can do it. If it doesn't make sense, then you don't want to be forcing it. Uh, and Hans, uh, you'd like to show your slides to your boss or show my slides to your boss. You can absolutely do that. Uh, we will be sending a replay in the next 24 hours, and that will include a link to the slides, and uh, you'll be able to use that. So we are three minutes over, so I'm going to wrap it up. I encourage everyone to complete the brief survey after this webinar. You should get redirected right to it. And uh, there's just four or five questions. It really shouldn't take more than one or two minutes of your time. And then we use that feedback to improve our future trainings. So thanks, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your Thursday and have a great weekend. Take care.